You are listening to the podcast When Life Gives You Lemons, presented by me, Emma Levy. Having worked with elite athletes for most of my career, it's always intrigued me that a significant number of high-performing individuals have encountered some form of adversity earlier in their lifetime. My fascination into this grew when I had my own brush with adversity, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in May 2020 in the midst of the global pandemic at the age of only 36. During this period, I questioned whether it was my positive mindset or maybe something deeper, which enabled me to bounce back and to train and compete for a triathlon just one month following completion of all active cancer treatment. The goal of this podcast is to explore this concept further by meeting a variety of high performing individuals who have experienced adversity, but who have come back stronger. Today, I am welcoming Sarah de la Garde to the podcast. Sarah is a chief communications officer author, mother of two, and double amputee. Sarah's life changed in September 22, when she had an accident at a tube station, where she fell through the gap and was hit by two tube trains. This resulted in the loss of her right arm and leg. Despite this, Sarah's mindset remains positive, and her message is one of optimism and strength. She is committed to inspiring others and raising awareness of diversity, equality, and inclusion. Sarah, thank you for coming down to Soho to talk to us today. Well, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Can we start in September 22 and can you tell us your story and what happened? So in on Friday the 30th of September in 2022, I was on my way home from work and I um, slipped on a wet platform and fell down the gap in between the platform and the train and I was not seen and the train departed and took my right arm with it. I screamed for help but nobody came and I remained on the tracks for about 15 minutes. A second train came in, crushed me again, this time my leg. I was still conscious and screaming for help and then eventually somebody heard me and um, raised the alarm. It took about another hour for um, the rescue services to arrive. Were there people on the platform that couldn't hear you? There were. So I had a look at the CCTV footage and there were people walking around. It wasn't that late on a Friday evening, nine mm-hmm. o'clock ish. So um, you could see people walking around. But I guess these days a lot of people have headphones on and don't really pay attention to their surroundings. Yeah. And should the drivers have seen you as well? I think so. I think that, you know, I I was wearing a bright pink coat and I've got white blonde hair. And so I should have been seen, yeah. really. It was late at night. Though. Well, was it, it wasn't that late. It was nighttime, though. It was dark. Are yes. the tracks lit? I, I don't know. I thought they were because mm. I remember being able to see. Um, so it wasn't that dark. I remember that I was lying on the tracks thinking, what do I do now? This is not the place I'm meant to be. Um, clearly something's really, really wrong with my right side. Um, and I was able to see across the tracks and I'd lost my phone, my mobile phone in the fall. And it had a orange, neon orange casing with lanyard. And in my in my head, I thought, if I could only reach that phone, I can call for help. And so, you know, there was enough light for me to see that, to mm. crawl over the tracks, all mangled. <laughs> I retrieved the phone. Um, I tried to unlock the screen, but it had facial recognition and it didn't work <sighs> because I'd broken my nose I'd broken my front teeth. Um, I was dirty and bloody, and and so my my next move was to think: well, if I can't open it up with my face, at least I can try to type in the code. But even that failed because my 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 fingers were wet and the phone was wet as well, so I couldn't get into the. So I remember thinking, like, all right, okay, well, this is not working back to plan A, which was screaming for help. So, And were you just literally screaming, help? Yeah, I, I remember screaming, you know, um, somebody please help me. My name is Sarah and I don't want to die. Just again and, and again, again and again. Yeah. And where did you find the energy to, to keep screaming that? I thought about that and there was there was one main driver and that was the 
the mental image of my children who were waiting at home and that really spurred me on because I could see their little faces and them, you know, just saying, Mom, what are you doing? You're supposed to be at home. So that was one driver. And my husband and I had climbed Kilimanjaro just a month before. So in August, um, we fulfilled the dream 10 years in the making. We really had, had this obsession about this mountain for years. And... Um, and I remember thinking, I'm not sure I'm going to make it to the top, but it's about the journey getting there. And if I manage to get to the top, then that's a bonus. And that took away the pressure. And I remember the main advice from the guides were to say, don't rush up the mountain. Just take it really slowly. And they have a saying, it's pole, pole, slowly, slowly, one step in front of the next. And... I did manage to get to the top. It was hard, <laughs> but it was manageable. And so as I was lying on the tracks just a month later, going from being on top of the world to literally hitting rock bottom, I had that sense of like, okay, I need to endure. This is not going to be easy. It's not going to be fast. I, I'm going to be out here for a while and I need to A, switch off the pain, focus the mind, slow down the breathing, slowly slowly hang in there yeah that's remarkable that you were able to do that in such a traumatic event and I talk often about these traumatic events and how we we forget lots of the moments when we go through trauma do you it seems like you've remembered quite a lot of what happened down there it's yeah it's really strange because my the clarity of the situation was was intense I could remember clearly seeing the puddle of water on, on which I slipped because it was reflecting the lights. Um, I can remember the sound of the oncoming train. I remember the smell of the wet gravels I was lying on, the way they dug in, into my back. So the, the, it's really quite clear. Yeah, your senses were really heightened. And have you have you had to deal with that then, all of those memories? Have you kind of been through things like therapy to help you with, with that? Yes. So I see a trauma psychologist on a regular basis, and that is really to try to make sense of why and how and what's next now. Um, but strangely, I didn't really have the nightmares that I was expecting I had a couple of really um, long nights in hospital where I was really terrified. And I think the trigger was a beeping sound in mm. the hospital room that sounded like the beeping sound of the closing doors of the of the tube. And that really, really terrified me mm. um, to a point where I remember being awake and scared, but unable to move like an animal who's in that flight or fight or freeze mode and I totally froze and I remember being immobile in the hospital bed for eight hours. Yeah, so you remember such key moments. Yeah. In TfL's final report, they, I believe they assumed you were intoxicated at the time of the accident. How did that make you feel when you read that? I thought that was a very unfair statement to make because they had no proof at all and they had just assumed it was just an easy way out for them also a way to blame the victim and that doesn't sit well with me at all I find that disgusting to be honest <laughs> Yeah, well, it's not really fair, is it? It's, it's not, not true. fair. And even and and here's the thing: it's like even if that still doesn't, you know, make them less responsible, mm. you know. And they haven't accepted any liability, have they? And they've not implemented any changes to their safety procedures following the accident. And and am I right in saying you've got a petition going at the moment and you're campaigning against this? Can, yes. Can you tell us a bit of, a bit about that? Yeah. So um, when when it was the the one year anniversary of the accident, I had it was 
a terrible weekend. I was really, really upset. I didn't expect it to affect me that much because it's actually just the date in the calendar. So I didn't think I was going to get emotional about it, but it was terrible. I mean, that whole weekend, it was a roller coaster of emotions. And what was the most upsetting is that I thought it's 12 months on and TfL has not accepted responsibility for what happened. Um, and to my knowledge, they have not implemented a single change since. And, uh, you know, the I did an interview in the FT and um, the investigative journalist who wrote the piece, Madison Marriage, she found data which, which is produced by TfL around a number of people who are in serious accidents on the tube. And there's 16 per month. And statistically, clearly, that is a very small percentage considering the millions of tube journeys. Mm -hmm. But these are 16 lives. And in our society, you know, we shouldn't have that. It shouldn't yeah. be the case. If we can, if we can prevent it from happening, then we should, because these are 16 lives times 12. You know, the cost of that even, you know, the cost to the NHS, the impact on the families, it, I find that outrageous. Yeah. And so that prompted me to think, okay, hang on a minute, this is not just about me. Like, I'm conscious that my limbs are never going to grow back. Like, I have to live with this permanent disability. And um, but my children are of age that they can use public transport, and I am sick to my stomach. I'm terrified of them going onto the tube because I know nothing has changed, and those gaps are there. And I spoke out publicly, you know, about what happened to me, and I've received hundreds and hundreds of messages of people saying, oh, this nearly happened to me. Wow. Or this happened to my toddler, or this happened to my mother-in-law. And in every scenario, there were a, a near miss. And every time it was a member of the public who saved them. Interestingly, never the staff. And that's where I thought like, okay, this is a lot bigger than initially, you know, initially thought. And so, going from 16 serious incidents a month to hundreds of near misses every time, I thought, okay, I need to, to do something about this. And so with no reaction from TfL, a petition is going. Within a week, we had like 27,000 signatures. It, like, it goes really quickly. That's amazing. And what do you think could and should be changed then if you were in charge? But that's a really unfair question because um, I'm not an engineer and I'm not working for the underground. So I don't have enough knowledge to be able to make recommendations. But I believe that there are a few basic things that are not being done right. Emergency procedures. What do you do when you're a staff and you find somebody stuck under a train. Yeah. You don't panic. You don't waste precious minutes yeah. finding, fumbling around with your phone, finding the number to call. Because there was loads of wasted time with you, wasn't there? Is that right? Once loads. you were found, they then couldn't get hold of the call centers and they couldn't see the number. And there was quite a lot of issues that had happened, hadn't it? Yeah. But that was, I suppose, at one particular station. Yeah. So what we don't know is if that's the same in all of the stations on the tube line. Yes. It's not a painting a positive picture, though. <laughs> it's not filling me with confidence, to be honest. But that, yeah, that is basic emergency training. That is basic writing down a number. <laughs> that is visible. Um, then the other thing that really shocked me was that CCTV footage is not being watched live. And so... There are AI programs who can do that. They can watch 3,000 feeds, you know, and spot irre irregularities mm -hmm. on them. So why are we not using that technology? Then there is, you know, every single car has got a sensor. Why are there no sensors on, on the tracks to, you know, alert when something the size of a human falls onto it? Mm -hmm. How come 
the incoming trains into a station don't have cameras. Yeah. Or driver's eyes. <laughs> you know, it seems exactly. so simple, doesn't it? As a car yeah. driver, if there's something lying in front of you, you, you normally see it. Right. And then there are things like, well, it doesn't come as a surprise that in the UK it rains. So how come we don't have platforms that are slip proof? Mm. Basic. Yeah. And and then more complicated perhaps is why is there a gap in the first place? Yeah. And, you know, that I I don't understand yeah. that, you know, we've got the Elizabeth line who's got the barriers, there's, you know, mm. no gaps here. It's it's very well thought out. Yeah. And then the rest of the network is just back to Victorian times. Yeah, I imagine that as a budget thing. I, I mean, I don't know, but obviously because the Elizabeth line is new and they were able to account for that, so they put in those big slidey doors. I mean, they've also got those, don't they, in like Waterloo, Westminster. So there's like the odd station where they have them. I know, and for me, that's an admittance of guilt, knowing that, well, this is an issue, yeah. therefore we put in the barriers, yeah. but then we don't put them everywhere. And so... Yeah, there's something not right. And I know I hear the budget um, argument quite often, but I'm I'm not buying it. I think there's always enough resources and, and, and budget. It's just the allocation of it. Yeah. And, and safety should be number one. Number one, because ultimately TFL is a public service. They have a duty of care for their passengers. And I feel that they are just taking liberties. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that Financial Times article, which I did read, and I was really interested to read that prior to your accident, you'd propose, you had a proposed PhD looking into how emergency service teams communicate with each other during crises, and you were going to look into what the corporate world could learn from their techniques. I mean, that's fairly close to home that you'd yes. considered that prior to your accident. Um, and then, obviously, your experiences with the emergency services that day, that's first-hand life experience where you're going to learn a lot more than any research study is going to learn. Um, can I ask, what did you learn about communication that day? I was so impressed, and I knew this before the accident because that was the, the topic of the PhD. And one of the reasons why I left late that night, um, left work late that night, was because I submitted my my proposal, and I was due to meet um, the the selection committee the next week to start a PhD. Wow. And of course, that's been now put on hold. Um, but I and I knew that that was the the right topic to look at because once I. Um, got looked after by the emergency services team that took me to the Royal London Hospital. I was so impressed because the communication patterns are incredibly efficient. So the 999 call gets routed, you know, straight to the helicopter emergency services. They then determine where the location is. The pilot needs to figure out where they're going to you know, have the helicopter land then they have in that team always a paramedic, a, a, a duty on duty trauma doctor, and they have inside that helicopter, in essence, an operating theater. Wow. Because I didn't know this before. I thought they were just a really fast way to transport patients back to hospital. But actually, they discovered that a patients have about a 45% higher chance of survival if they get treated on site. So that so you need a doctor there, a yes. trauma um, doctor, really, to and, save you. And that's exactly what happened. So the team communicate, team communication is highly efficient. They arrive on site, they analyze the situation. How do we get this person out from underneath the train? Um, they had to slide me on 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 this surfboard like device under the carriages right to the front of the train then pull me out under the, you were slid all the way forward yeah because they couldn't slide me out in between I was wedged in between wow. um, so it was quite an adventurous rescue including the team having to wait until the power line was cut off because mm. they wouldn't want to risk their their lives either so and I remember that the trauma doctor was Dr. Benjamin Marriage was holding my hand, 
my 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 left hand and talking to me and saying like stay here you know we we're rescuing you and there was a moment where i'd waited so long that i could feel that my body was trying to give up so i could feel that there was this um lump of ice in my chest it was really cold and it was spreading across my chest and i could feel that was probably a sign of things not going that well mm. and i i said that i said oh do you mind hurrying up please <laughs> so british <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> please if you don't mind um and then they were like you, you, you can't die now we're literally at least 50 people on the platform you know all setting up to save you so you can't give up okay then <laughs> <laughs> okay because <laughs> you are so nice <laughs> and yeah they lifted me out put me on a stretcher scanned my whole body for any injuries um they put the tourniquets on my my limbs to stop the bleeding and they gave me pain relief so all of that before i even got to the hospital so mm. and i credit my survival to these these guys really and do you remember then their communication with you and do you think that the way they communicated with you was a significant part of keeping you alive absolutely i know that uh, they described me as being really calm focused pale um and i just remember them talking to me asking me would you like some additional pain relief that was in the on the way to the hospital and I was like no no I'm fine <laughs> no way <laughs> <laughs> but then you know they said like normally patients arrive there they're like thrashing about and yeah. panicking and I was the complete opposite totally focused on not spending any energy yeah. just conserving the energy and 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 the only thing I kept saying to them was like you need to contact my husband my husband doesn't know find his number and they were like well we don't know the number do you remember the number and I'm like no I can't remember the number <laughs> oh my god that must have been hard yeah it was that was pretty dramatic that moment yeah. yeah so you managed to stay calm and you attribute that to your Kilimanjaro experience yes yeah um can we talk about life as a double amputee yes um so I believe you lost your right arm and your right leg at the ankle Is so that? yeah so the the, the leg was amputated um, below the knee mm -hmm. and the arm amputated above the elbow. And I've read that something happened when you crowdfunded for this amazing bionic arm. Yes. I was kind of hoping you'd have it here today because as uh, a physio, I was quite fascinated <laughs> to see that. But. No, actually, I'm so sorry. I, yes, I can't showcase it today because I wore it at work yesterday for... 14 hours straight and wow. I unfortunately it does blister up when I wear it for too long so I'm giving it a break today <laughs> <laughs> um can you tell us about the crowdfunded the crowdfunding you did because I think that shows amazing community spirit that was an incredible moment but it started off with my husband doing some research as I was in hospital trying to to recover he already thought about the next steps and I remember being really clear about if you amputate my arm, actually saying this to the surgeon, <laughs> if you amputate my arm, could you make sure that you don't replace it with a Barbie plastic arm? I want <laughs> I want a robot arm. And the surgeon, I'm sure he was a bit perplexed and thinking, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he told me, he said, look, um, that's not how it works. I cut it off <laughs> and then in two, three years, you'll probably get a, a prosthetic arm. And I thought, no way, I'm going to wait that long. And I remember saying that to my husband, saying like, you have to find me an arm. I can't, this is, I need it. And so he did the research, spoke to other amputees, found out that um, bionics had come a long way. And uh, unfortunately, though, the price tag was quite significant. And, um, and he put, in his head, he put together the two bits where we needed the uh, significant amount of money. Were we going to go for the latest technology and the willingness of people to help? Everybody asked, you know, what does she need? Another blanket? <laughs> some, some, you know, some chocolate. And and my husband was like, well, I'm setting up this GoFundMe page. So if you want to chip in, then that will go towards her arm 
And uh, I remember he investigated the price tag and he said it's going to be about £300,000 for the hardware, but yeah. also the physio hours, the training and etc. And uh, and I remember thinking, are you mad? We will not. I mean, that's a quarter of a million. £250,000 is where he set the limit. I said, we would be lucky if we get 10000 And 19 days later, as I exited the rehabilitation center to come home, we had the money. Wow. And I cried for <laughs> every single donation. <laughs> Whether it was hundreds or two pounds fifty. Yeah. I, I honestly every time I couldn't believe it. I it was friends, family, colleagues, and then the, the general public. Wow. So it just got shared. Yeah. On social media, basically. Yeah. So people were just seeing that didn't know you at all and just giving a few pounds. And I mean, I still get emotional yeah, about yeah, it today yeah. because then what it does, it's you feel like you've got a supportive community. Mm-hmm. And I still have that today is that it feels like running a marathon. And then you've got people you know, at some point you, you, you feel like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I just, I'm too exhausted. It's too painful. And then you've got people on the sides cheering you on and when they do that you find that energy and you find that deep down you still have something to give and then you you continue yeah well they've got your back don't they exactly it gives you that drive and that motivation to keep going yeah and um, so that bionic arm i've seen pictures of it does it work through you thinking about movement so it's connected to kind of your brain your nerves or, or how conscious has movement got to be with that arm on it's a bit of a geeky physio question. But. Yes, but it's a great question because, you know, um, people have asked me, oh, do you have a microchip in your in your brain? I've said, no, it's not like that. Um, it is a way of breaking down the different, well, the movement into different phases. So your brain thinks about a movement, then it twitches the muscles in the remaining um, muscles of your arm. Mm-hmm. There are electrodes on the socket of the, the 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 bionic arm that capture those minimal movements. Sometimes it's just a fraction of a movement, and they translate that into electric impulses, and that moves the hand. And are you able to literally move forward and pick up a cup? I can, yeah. And how conscious is? I mean, I imagine that's literally you sitting there thinking, "I'm going to pick up that cup now. I need to move my shoulder, elbow." Is it that conscious? Yes. Yeah. So you break it down into all these little movements. Which, you know, on the other side, yeah, on, on, the, on the left side, I don't even think about it, it just happens. And uh, the technology within the arm includes artificial intelligence. And every movement that I make is continuously registered. And it's data that is being saved on this server that powers the uh, elbow and the hand and the wrist as well. And... Uh, the aim with that is that the arm learns which movements I make the most often and which movements I'm struggling with. And it's learning how to complete those movements to make it easier for me. Because at the moment, the the, the, the delay between thinking about a movement and actioning it is about 10 seconds, which mm. is very long. Mm. So if somebody throws a ball at me, I'll go, wee. <laughs> By the time I raise my hand, yeah. the ball's already passed. And so the artificial intelligence over time hopefully will decrease that delay. So, so it should become more subconscious over time. You want to pick up that cup and you can just pick up that cup. And incredibly so. So I've been using the arm for about, well, since August, really. And for certain gestures, it already does so where I'm like, oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even think about it Con- really? consciously. And wow. it just happens. Like opening and closing, holding on to something. So that, I can see that happening, yeah. And the arm is heavy. It's heavy. How heavy is it? So I am yet to weigh it, but it's mm. it's it's quite heavy. And you can feel it because it hangs off your your shoulder, basically. So it's hanging, yeah. pulling. So you must get a sore neck. Yeah, I imagine. So in preparation of getting the arm, I had a mechanical arm, which was already heavier, meant to train my back muscles to be able to carry the real thing. And uh, it took months, months of 
yeah, training. Yeah. You know, those elastic bands. <laughs> and all of those physio <laughs> exercises. Um, I mean, I, I have quite a challenging question with, with the bion- bionic arm. Is it worth it? Is it worth that hard work, that heaviness, that skin blistering to achieve a really difficult conscious thought of doing a small task? Yes, I think it's worth it because there are various aspects of it that are really important to me. So A is balance, because both amputations happen on the same side. I would be naturally now crooked, basically. Mm. I need the the arm just to center myself. So that's one aspect that I find really important. Then there is aesthetics. I feel disabled without my prosthetics. And with the prosthetics, I feel almost superhuman, Mm. right? So that's the second aspect that I find really important. And then the third is those little gestures mean the world to me, like being able to hold a bottle so I can unscrew it with the other hand. That's a tiny movement, a tiny action that is so important to me. Being able to hold a a zipper so I can close a bag Mm -hmm. without having to ask for help. Being able to tie my shoelaces by myself. And these are all small, you know, probably insignificant gestures for others, but they are so important to me. Yeah. So you talked about um, like feeling disabled without your arm. Have you struggled with the way people relate to you? And have you kind of... um, been acutely aware of any inequalities or any prejudices out there? I think the the, the starkest realization I had was um, shortly after the accident and I hadn't learned how to walk again and so I was in a wheelchair and sitting in a wheelchair changes the way people perceive you and so all of a sudden I realized that doctors were talking to my husband um, people, members of the public, were talking to my husband where I was sitting in the wheelchair yeah. and I thought, guys, you're talking about me. I'm here. <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah. I can talk to you. Yeah. And so that was, a, that was a stark realization where you think like, okay, this is how people react. Um, and then, of course, walking around with two prosthetics, especially in summertime where you don't cover it up them up people have a tendency to stare Mm. and I I don't want to feel like I'm a circus attraction like I I'm very open about the accident I'm very interested in the science the bionics the engineering and I'm happy to share that but I find it really strange when people you know, whisper or point fingers yeah. and that just makes me feel other. Yeah, and you don't want to feel different, do you? You don't, you don't want people to be looking at you. Um, so I work with Paralympians. So, you know, if we often chat with them about it's kind of celebrating their disabilities. Have you got any thoughts on that and how you could move forward in terms of, I don't know, did you do any sport that you're thinking about disability sport? Have you been to any of those? Um, you know, you know, they try and find athletes, basically. Have you had any thoughts on that? I, hmm, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. I, I discovered a newfound respect for my body. Actually, I think my body is pretty amazing. And I, I noticed that in the first few days in hospital, how I felt like almost like a vibration going through my body where every single cell was on high alert saying like, we have to repair this body. (laughs) And it did it in record time. And I'm ever so grateful. You know, I already had that respect for my body when I managed to get up to the top of Kilimanjaro where I thought, wow, okay, pretty decent, you know. Um, And now I know that I will have to look after my muscles, my joints for the rest of my life because aging is already terrifying, but aging with two prosthetics seems almost impossible. And so 
I have found a new discipline in me to train as regularly as possible. Yeah, the importance of exercise. The <laughs> importance of mobility and the yeah. privilege of mobility. All of a sudden, it makes you realize like, oh my gosh, I yeah. was so lucky to have two legs to be able to walk around because when you're stripped of that, mm. all of a sudden you realize I would be confined to my bed. Yeah. And that would be my whole world, yeah. which is awful. How has your mindset changed since your accident? I am more present. I'm in the moment. I realize that accidents can happen in a blink of an eye. Um, even on your doorstep, even in a what I thought would be a safe environment. I didn't have an accident while doing something extreme, mm. <laughs> you know. And the way I talk to my children about it is say, well, let's think about this. If accidents as severe as mine can happen at any time in any place, then why should we worry? We might as well do all the things because why not? And so my kids have embraced that as well. And Uh, not so long ago, we climbed the O2. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that was quite fun. I wanted oh, wow. to do this with my family because I wanted to show them and say, look, I might struggle, but I'll do it anyways. Yeah. And it was fine. I didn't struggle that much. <laughs> it was okay. Yeah, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose just to be able to demonstrate your, to your kids, look, I'm okay. Yeah. I can still walk. I can still and, walk. And climb up, yeah. you know, a big building. And there's, you know, there's the... There's a reality is that, yes, it hurts and there are blisters mm -hmm. and you know, it's emotionally also tough where you think, oh, gosh, just, you know, over a year ago, that would have been so easy to do. And now I'm struggling. And then there's the other part is where I look at my children. And I'm like, yeah, it's fine. I can do this. Yeah. You know, you find that that strength. And looking at how far you've come in just one year, which is we haven't really said that yet. It's quite remarkable because on the time span of a amputee normally, They take a lot longer to get to where you are today, don't they? Yeah, but I guess that's, I'm stubborn. <laughs> it's the willpower, I think. Yeah. But also it's the fact that I've got the support of family, that I've, I've got my kids to inspire and to mm. reassure as well. So that, that takes a lot, a lot of, of focus. Have you always had this positive belief system then? Or do you think that has evolved over the, the past year? I think I was I was always resilient because I had a, a, a I'm not going to say difficult childhood but a, a challenged childhood where I lived in the south of France in a fairly rural community and I stood out like a sore thumb because I wasn't French and that you know you know how children are if you're slightly different and you treated differently there was a bit of bullying involved so. But that resilience was built up then where I thought, well, okay, this is hard, but I'll do it anyway. And it kind of pushed me further. And I think that contributed to this positive mindset that I had, the, the fact that the, the job that I did involved staying calm in a crisis, crisis management was my focus and for years. And yeah, I guess that builds a thick skin. Yeah, so you had kind of the background training, if you like, for, for what was to come. Yeah. Um, I'm speaking to you quite early on in your journey. Like we said, it's only a year and a half, isn't it? 14 um, months. 14 months, not even a year and a half. And conversations I've had with previous guests who have been through traumatic incidents, sometimes they surprise me and they tell me that their lives feel enriched by what they've been through. Where are you at with that at the moment? I guess the the right at the beginning, I could really feel the glow of being alive and how grateful I was for that. And a year on, it slightly shifts because then reality sets in where you think, okay, this isn't a broken ankle and a broken arm. This will never repair itself. The, the limbs will never grow back. This is a permanent situation. And that is very difficult to deal with. So I had Martine Wright on the podcast um, a few weeks ago, who was the most injured survivor of the London terror attacks, 7-7, and she lost both her legs. Um, and she then went to the Paralympics in London. Um, and she said if you gave her a time machine, she wouldn't she wouldn't use it. No. No, she was in the sitting volleyball team. Yes. Um, and she feels that her life has been enriched following that. 
that yeah. incident. But and when people say this to me I, I, about my situation as well, I say, well, I, I'm not ready to admit that yet with what I went through with my cancer. Um, even though positives have come from it, I don't yet feel that my life is enriched because of it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, hopefully it is a journey. Yeah, it is a journey. And there is, you know, there is acceptance that goes mm. with it. So I am in that phase where I start feeling the acceptance. But I can't say that. I yeah. Not yet. And I think the, the, the fear of the future is quite strong. Um, yeah. It kind of, this accident stopped me in my tracks. I had a, a career path and I felt like I was just about to hit something great. Just about to like really get into my stride. And then I got you know, shot yeah. down. And the future is uncertain. Mm. There's a lot of cost involved living with um, with this level of, of disability. And I worry about that. Yeah. Are you back at work? So I, I, I am back at work in a part time capability and I won't be able to return to um, that same job. And that makes me sad because I loved it. It was kind of, you know, my career path and I spent 20 years forging it and I can't do it anymore. It's mm. it's not not feasible. Mm. You said that the future is uncertain, but, you know, maybe this is one of those amazing pivot moments where actually what you do, you know, where you do go will will take you down that path of life enrichment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Final question I ask all my guests, if you could go back in time to when things were at their toughest, what do you wish you could have told yourself? Oh, gosh, I would have told myself, don't worry, you'll be able to walk again. I guess mm. that, that was... My biggest worry was to to stay in a wheelchair forever. And I remember my my friends, my family, my colleagues, they said like if there's one person who can, you know, do this, it's you because you've got the willpower and the stubbornness. And I looked at them and I thought, Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> I I admire your you know, your positivity and mm. your faith in me, but I'm not sure I can overcome this. And I would I would go back in time and just say, don't worry, you can do this. Yeah. You know the word stubborn? So many of my guests have attributed their stubbornness to achieving what they set out to achieve. And I find that really interesting because growing up, you're taught that stubborn is quite a negative thing. Yes. That's a really good point. Mm. But you're right. I mean, maybe maybe it's willpower. But stubbornness is really when... You don't give up. Yeah. So you try something, it doesn't work out, you go back, then you try again, and then you go back, and then you try again, and then you go back. So it's it's not giving up, really. And actually, it's a positive attribute, I would say. Absolutely. Um, Sarah, thank you. Thank you for coming to talk to us today. I do think your mindset is remarkable. You. And you've probably heard it before, and it's probably quite boring, but I think you are an inspiration. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you continue to get your message out there with your lobbying for a safer transport system. Um, and I hope that we do start to see some changes made. So thank Thank you. I hope so too. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Sarah Delagarde. If you did, please rate it, review it and share it with anyone you know so they can also hear Sarah's amazing story. Thank you.